This is Sophie, the food blogger behind A Kitchen in Uganda. And what you are listening to is our new podcast called Our Food Stories. A podcast where we as a community share food stories from our past that have raised and sustained our ancestors and eventually ourselves. Episode 9 Did you know that shea butter is edible? The world has seen a rapid increase in the consumption of shea butter, especially in the hair care and skincare industries lately. But did you know that it has multiple other uses? You will find out in today's story, which is told by special guest Bridget Amolo, who comes from the Lango region in northern central Uganda. The region is generally dry when compared to other parts of Uganda and receives one long rainy season, despite the fact that it is situated situated along the shores of Lake Kyoga and Lake Kwania. It is with this background that I present this story to you. I think we should have a penonga for lunch today. You don't know what that is? Let me tell you all about it. A penna in English is pigeon peas. Ngako is a descriptive term of one of the processes through which the wonderful dish is made. Now, a penongaho is it is the traditional dish of my people, the Lao people that are found um, in the northern parts of Uganda and speak Langi as a native language. And as I had said, I'm one of them. <laughs> Although the dish can be made in a number of different ways, for example, Cello, which is frying, lello, which is pasting, um, mixing with greens such as malakwang, boju, and others, smashed pigeon peas in particular, is a sweetheart of them all. Every time my mother traveled to the village, she would come back with local chicken, moyao, which is um, locally made shea butter, amaido, which is ground nuts, sim sim. But most importantly, she would come back with a penna. Now, um, I saw her very, very many times transform these humble and uh, tiny seeds into a very luxurious, lustrous, and very delicious meal. She would start by toiching, which is sun drying. Then she would sort the pigeon peas to remove stones while winnowing using anoderu. Anoderu is a flat surface. It's flat. It's made using reeds. So they they sew the reeds together and then they finish it off with cow dung to make sure it is smooth. And it is what she would always use. She she would hold the oderu and then put the pigeon peas and then after she would start to winnow. She would like in motion pour the seeds up and then blow over them so that the dust could go to remove that dust, you know. And then when they land back on, she would do it over and over again, over and over again. And she would be singing her favorite Langi songs. She would be whistling while going at it. And it was such a pleasure to watch. So after, after the winnowing is done, winnowing to remove dust and then... um sorting to remove stones um my mom had a, an array of local many of them local kitchen tools and a grinding stone was one of them now on days like this she would get it from the store and use it to do the knock of the pigeon peas grinding lightly of the pigeon peas so she would kneel down by then we had a it, it was a, a, a cement floor, but it was a rough floor. So she would put um, the pigeon peas in front of her, kneel down, and then get a little portion from a heap of the pigeon peas she would be having. Use the, the grinding stone to grind over them lightly. By the way, a grinding stone in Leblanc, in the Langi language, is called Kidi. So what I noticed is that when she was grinding over the pigeon peas, it wasn't as intense as it was usually when she was making peanut butter. I think the reason is simple. It's because when she was grinding the pigeon peas, her intention was only to lightly bruise them and uh, break the pods into two shoes. So she wasn't trying to make a fine paste as it is with OD. After that, 
she would go slowly slowly little by little little by little until the hip was finished and then she would push all these that were now broken back and then go over them once more what she would be trying to do is actually lose the tester of the pigeon peas and separate it from the seed inside and um, she would go over it once once twice most times it would be twice in very rare cases three times then after that when she had um, confirmed that most of the seeds have been broken into two and are uh, losing the seed coat she would then put the seeds in any pine the pigeon peas in any pine any pine is um a mortar it is a mortar but our mortar at home was a big one it was black in color and its pencil was so long it was taller than me and if i remember well it was about nine or eight but it was taller than me even then i grew up and outgrew it it was dark long and it was a bit heavy because many times she would call me to help her and then i'd put my hands under hers and then we'd both in motion create the pounding the pounding the process is called churu churu is um it could be almost like pounding but not roughly and the pigeon peas while they are they go through the, the process of churu is to continue to aid the removal of the tester the removal of that seed coat from the seed so we she would do it lightly not with so much force it would be light light and not many times lightly lightly after that she would again get all these seeds and win of them a second time but this time it was not to remove dust or stones as it was the first time this time it would be to blow away the seed coats that had loosened so she would do that and lose them then she would proceed to to wash the pigeon peas hurriedly and discard the water she said that if you took your time with the washing the flavor of the peas would diffuse into the water of which the water you would pour so the pigeon peas would not be as delicious <laughs> as they are supposed to be in fact she told me that it is for that reason that some people choose not to wash them at all and go direct to the next step which is bdp bdp is soaking in water she herself would soak the seeds for maybe 20 minutes 20 minutes or 25 or 30. i used to ask her why she doesn't you know soak the, the pigeon peas overnight and she said that if you soak the pigeon peas overnight the water starts to smell and because it is the very water you're supposed to use to cook the peas the dish would be literally unpalatable so after bdp for 20 30 minutes she would use she would then use a local sieve a local sieve is um the reason why i'm not calling it a local sieve is because it's not like any of the sieves i see on the market these days for it it was a small rectangle not very small but sizable rectangle it had a wooden frame and uh, a wire mesh underneath and she you would hold it with two hands so she would hold it with two hands and then in most times i would help her pour the water that has the seeds through it and then she would be creating a motion with her hands like one two one two something like that both sides like up down up down up down up down now because the the testers would be light lighter than the seeds they would go to one side and then the seeds would go the other side then she would remove all the testers and discard them and then pour these seeds back into the water and still first let the water set for about a minute or two and then continue do the same pour the water through the sieve create a motion remove the top she told me one time that if you do not have a sieve because it's not like every home in in the lao language in the lao sub region or, or homes it's not that every home up there has a sieve so most of them would put a lot of water and because um the seeds are, the testers are lighter they would float on top 
Now when they float on top, then a person would carefully have to lift the saucepan and pour them off, right? And then wait again, let this sit, remove the testers from where they had been disposed, then bring that water back into the main saucepan and then continue. But when you don't use a sieve and you use that method, it does not very much affect the flavor but it will affect the look of it because it won't be as smooth and it will have a discoloring you know here and there of the the color of the testers which is like dark red here there here there so lucky for her or lucky for us we did have a sieve and that is what i used to see her do so after that for the perfectionist she is she she would do that really quite a number of times maybe 10 i don't know 10 12 but it was a number of times now she would use that same water and put it in a gulu in a gulu gulu in english is a pot we did have a traditional pot that she would pull out in instances like this and then she would put the pigeon peas and then she would add um kaduburu lao kaduburu lao is um it would be, i think it it could or should be an equivalent of rock salt but for it it's locally made using ash i remember very well it was only christmas that we used to have blue bands <laughs> that our father used to buy blue bands huh? she would keep that tin and when she wanted to make kaduburu but i used to see her put kaduburu in other things also like when she was cooking very old beans she would also put kaduburu lang. so this kaduburu lang, she would get that tin put a knife in fire and then after it was hot you know red and all then she would get it and start to pierce under this blue band this blue band tin then create incisions and then she would put ash into that tin now that i remember we never used to throw away ash we always had ash in the house we had a, a polythene a small a small bag with ash every time someone was going to make a fire they would first collect the ash from under the, the charcoal stove or under the um, the sigiri put it in the cover and just put it in its place so she would get it then she would put it in that tin and then get another plate put it under and let the steam sit on it and then she would pour, pour water over into the tin so this water would pass through the ash and then go down concentrated i used to see her do this the night before if she was to make a dish like this but also in most instances she always had we always had that kaduburu somewhere in the house it would be somewhere so that every time she would need to use it she would just pour water into it and then that would be done <laughs> okay now after adding the kaduburu she would let the peas cook 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 it would be some good hours four maybe five maybe six but until they were so soft and literally just falling apart until they could no longer sustain their structure and then they would just start falling apart she would then salt them add salt and um use a lurum wedge a lurum wedge i it, it could be it looks a lot like a like a mingling stick but it's not for it it has a, a flat surface on on its bottom and so she you would she would stick it in the pot and then swirl it around swirl it around swirl it around mashing 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 and then put it up and then put it back and mash mash this would continue to make the pigeon peas fall apart fall apart and create a very thick and um, smooth consistency that you would feel it you would feel it in your throat going down <laughs> so she would get the little much round and round round and round and then she would pass it she would start from a point in the middle and then go advancing to the sides to the sides to the sides and then lift it up go back in the middle i used to enjoy doing that too she would let me do it sometimes but most the, i think the sweetest memory was always holding out my hand and then she would put put it up and blow it 
and then put in my hand so it would leave like a stamp in my hand and then i would lick it and then put my hands again and then again and they should give me more and that would go on and on now if i tell you that that dish tastes like heaven it tastes like love on a plate it tastes almost too good to be true after she had satisfied that it was the correct consistency she wanted because you could always add water and not cold water you know when when you're boiling pigeon peas when they're boiling they start to bubble over they form a they, they form kind of a gray form and then they would always scoop this gray form and put it in a in a cup or a tin somewhere so that if in case this dish needed some more, more water they would use this very form that would now would have condensated into water into a liquid and then pour it back into the pot so you could add and then go around you know with the smoothening out and then pour more like that or if it was maybe too light you could continue cooking 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 until it was a desired consistency at home we used to cook hours where they were not they were charcoal stoves they used charcoal but mom built them herself using um leftover bricks and um soil and um she would uh she would first lay the bricks then she would put you know the bicycle where the paddle of the bicycle is attached that thing that is round that has the wire that keeps rotating as someone is riding that thing she would put it in the middle it is where the, the charcoal would sit and then she would uh, arrange those leftover bricks and then she would secure them together using cow dung so that is the kind of stove we used to use to cook and it, it it used to stay so warm that even if charcoal is finished the sauce will continue to bubble to bubble but anyway starting a war with my mother in those days was not really difficult at all i mean you could just break that while maybe mingling posho you have a war <laughs> you have a war anyway hapenongaho is not complete not at all just when it's ready it is complete the moment moyao appears on the table and i believe almost every luo home has a bottle of moyao somewhere they always have it so every time she'd make a dish like this she would bring the moyao moyao is like i don't know it's it should be the word i don't know i cannot find a word to describe what it is but it is what completes apenongaho that is why the dish is actually called apenongaho kedemo yaiwe meaning smashed pigeon peas topped with shea butter <laughs> we used to to enjoy we when i say we i mean me my mother and my two brothers and my two sisters and everyone at home my mother used to serve it with mostly chalk which is sweet potato ponkal which is um kalo or millet bread mogo which is cassava and anything that would be available but those two ichokere kuonkal um sweet potatoes and millet pair better with the apenonga hao plus the moyao but personally i must be weird because i used to enjoy it so much the next day and by itself mwah, loved it love it still love it will always love it <laughs> Apenonga ho by the way is not only a delicacy for the Langi people for the Langi or the Lang people but also they are choli they are lur the kumam and the japadola testify to how delicious it is Apenonga ho never misses on, a, on an occasion be it a name naming ceremony wedding anniversary birthday Oh even if there is a guest visiting it is always there in all its glory and after all this i am sure that you would love to test it Wow 
I love stories and the fact that Bridget was very expressive and detailed made the listening experience even more special. Thank you, Bridget, for sharing this beautiful story with us. If you haven't already noticed, Bridget is such a wonderful storyteller and that level of detail is evident in her work. She owns a catering business called Brie Events located in Entebbe. They do food deliveries, outside catering and private chef services for all occasions. Think weddings, introduction ceremonies, graduations, anniversaries, birthdays, etc. They do it all. In 2021 alone, they cater to about 200 events. So if you're looking for a catering company or a private chef for your next event, reach out to Brie Events on Instagram at Brie underscore events underscore 256 and Facebook under Amolo Bridget. Season 1 is coming to an end and this is the second last episode in the season. The 10th and last episode will be shared in the next two weeks before we take a short break. But before the season ends, I am asking you for three things. Firstly, share this podcast with as many people as you can because not only do we get to enjoy the stories, but we get to learn new terms, foods and techniques with each and every episode and I would love for this to continue. Secondly, Leave a comment if you are listening on YouTube, a review or a rating if you are listening from your favorite podcasting platforms. This helps the platforms push the podcast to even more listeners. And lastly, if you enjoy listening to these stories and you have a delicious food story you would like to share with us or you know someone that does, reach out to me via email at a kitchen in Uganda at gmail.com or send me a DM on Instagram at a kitchen in Uganda. See you in the next episode.